everybody and welcome to tonight's event, AWEN Encountering Climate Emergency. I'm Amanda Tindall, I'm the Festival and Creative Director at Edinburgh Science, who are delighted to have been involved in the creation of the AWEN Digital Climate Walk experience. It's a playful local walk encountering global climate events and using interactive art, sound, movement and play prompted by global climate data and science. It aims to give audiences a deeply personal encounter with global climate and environment. In tonight's event, you'll have an exclusive first chance to hear from some of the creative team behind a project that touches on so many things close to both my and the Science Festival's heart, merging science with art and the digital and creative industries, providing us with a COVID safe festival experience in such an uncertain year, and aiming to engage the public with issues surrounding climate change, so important as we face a climate crisis that's undoubtedly the defining challenge of our age. So I'm joined today by some key members of a much larger multidisciplinary team that have been involved in making AWARE a reality. So say hello and give us a wave as I say your names. Uh, first up, we have Ines Kamara Leret, our lead artist. Hello, Ines. Uh, we have Brenda McCarthy, interactive digital designer and one half of Ray Interactive. We have Matt Vidmar, experiential AI research lead at the Edinburgh Futures Institute. And we have Daisy Narayanan, Senior Manager for Mobility and Placemaking at the City of Edinburgh Council. So we'll hear a bit about each of our panel members from their own mouths in a moment, followed by a short shared discussion and then some time for audience Q&A. So do submit your questions through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens as they come to mind and flag if it's aimed at anyone in particular and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Now, without further ado, I'll first pass over to Matt to tell us a bit about the new real program of experiential artificial intelligent research at the Edinburgh Futures Institute, about his role in AWEN and about how the experience works and what it aims to do. Over to you, Matt. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. And of course, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and let me also use this opportunity to say a big thanks to Amanda and the Science Festival. Uh, they have been brilliant partners and collaborators throughout this project. Um, and we've been working very closely together for the past eight months. And, and the, the, the AWEN as the uh, walking experience as, as, as it's been released um, is definitely kind of a, a shared endeavor and a share uh, fruit of our labor. So um, thanks to Amanda and of course, Jennifer and, and others uh, in the Science Festival uh, who helped uh, make this um, um, a reality. Um, so a little bit about, uh, first of all, um, experiential AI, new real, um, and then of course, um, AWEN. Um, so um, experiential AI is effectively a, a research program, a research agenda, uh, trying to uh, contextualize um, the sort of social dimensions of the emerging artificial intelligence technology and its applications using primarily arts as, as a way of, of inquiry. Um, and this agenda has been put forward in, you know, uh, within the Edinburgh Futures Institute, uh, led primarily by uh, Dr. Drew Hammond, um, who is also the, the lead um, instigator of uh, the New Real program. The New Real program is a bit more specific. The New Real program engages particularly uh, with using the current um, sort of digital transformation. Uh, partially a feature of our times with, of course, the uh, rollout of ever, ever better, more efficient um, in, in information technology infrastructure, um, as well as, of course, the current uh, COVID uh, pandemic, where a lot of the um, content, cultural content production has moved from physical spaces into online environments um, and use this moment effectively to catalyze uh, a bit better understanding uh, how arts can be not only um, delighting audiences using new technologies, uh, but also um, building on critical literacies around understanding what is data, what is artificial intelligence, how does this processing actually work, um, and how do the inputs um, and, 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 the, and the outputs sort of um, impact on, on the way uh, society is, is developing um, socially, economically, politically in many different ways. Um, so the New Real program uh, has launched last summer um, and very successfully delivered two pilot projects. If you um, are interested, you can go to the uh, newreal.cc website uh, where you can see um, all three now projects. So uh, the first two were released earlier this year, um, the ZZ uh, show and Mechanized Cacophonies. Um, but tonight we're talking especially about our third project, um, AWEN, 
um, and its um, its development um, and 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 what it's actually trying to tell us. So a when um, is in a in a way a, a way to pilot for us to pilot a co-creation methodology. Uh, so with AWEN, we're going far beyond the ordinary artistic commissioning um, that um, si the festivals um, often use in order to produce new kinds of experiences for, uh, for audiences. With AWEN, uh, what we're trying to facilitate is a dialogue between different um, disciplines, uh, both in science um, as well as with arts, design, um, using a structure pro a framework um, that we call open prototyping. Effectively, it's it's a way to um, steer conversations um, and try and 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 develop um, common ideas and 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 approaches um, that we can all sort of um, um, de develop together um, and and create a more rich and and multi-layered experience. Um, so. Um, awen has been the fruit of, as I said, the past um, eight uh, months of labor, working very closely with the Science Festival, as well as with a big uh, team of, of co-developers. Uh, we are delighted to have um, Ines and Brendan here with us uh, tonight, but there's a, about 10 or so people involved uh, in the core uh, creative production. Um, its main objective was to use a, a, a what we noticed as a gap between global perspectives on our climate emergency, something that we've kind of realized, um, you know, for the past few years that, you know, this is a very, very real, very acute uh, problem. Um, and, and that global perspective, a global understanding is somehow disconnected from the immediacy of our everyday lives, particularly here in the West, particularly in, in places like Scotland, for instance, where though we can experience some of the effects of things like climate change, we are not necessarily in the front line of the most severe impact. And so um, it, the, the, the challenge that we set out to this interdisciplinary team was really to try and find out a new way in which we can use the digital technology, the artificial intelligence, in order to tell this story and to bridge this divide between the global perspective on our changing climate and environment and the local in, in, intimate experience um, of, of everyday interactions with both you know, weather and, and, and other environmental phenomena. I think that's probably enough for now. <laughs> Great, thank you for that, Matt. Um, so we will pass now over to Ines. Um, to talk to us a little bit about herself, her artistic practice, and why she wanted to be a part of the AWEN journey. Over to you, Ines. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so my name is Ines Kamara Lorette, and I'm an artist. I explore life through that which is not visible, is portrayed as static, or is seemingly ephemeral. Um, throughout my work, my main source of inspiration is the transformative capacity of materials, natural processes, but also um, gaining access to highly specialized equipment. Um, my work is highly collaborative. I work across disciplines and mediums, and this has led me to collaborate with crystallographers, botanists, engineers, geographers, um, a wide scope of um, people working in different areas. Um, recently, for the past two or three years, I have focused um, predominantly on weather, and this has culminated in a site-specific installation called Weather the Weather that recreates weather conditions of the same day, but of past and future years. Um, so when I, I was um, invited to, to this project, I was really interested because it's sort of linked with weather, but in a much um, direct way, speaking of climate. Um, my role throughout this project was to think of ways of engaging people physically, but remotely because of COVID, um, with our current ecological crisis. And although my title um, was lead artist, as um, Matt and Amanda said, um, it's been a complete collaborative and co-creative process. Um, so the idea structure and the content itself was currently was constantly developed and redeveloped through um, conversations, discussions, um, thoughts that um, were had from everyone in the team. Um, and I guess one of the things that made this project really valuable and enriching for me personally was um, these conversations that were had. Um, due to the fantastic people that I've met, um, hopefully one day in person. 
Um, and some of them are here today, but there's also people who haven't, um, that haven't been able to make it to this event, like Mal, Susie, Tom, um, and Martin, who have been instrumental in the development of the work as well. Um, in terms of a when, it invites the public to engage physically with their surrounding environment. Um, it asks you to use a leaf, a leaf's veins like a map, or to rest, you know, beneath things that you wouldn't necessarily rest near. Um, it takes on the changing climate and provides short glimpses of how this hyper object that climate change is um, might manifest locally. And um, it's a slow and participatory experience. So you have to go on the 30 plus minute journey. Um, and that for me is incredibly valuable because I think it contrasts with our current culture of speed and immediacy. Um, so it forces us to slow down whilst making us move. Um, and the work itself is inspired by ecofeminism, by post-humanist thought. Um, it uses game mechanics, but it also steers away from climate narratives that are usually found within um, media outlets. So um, it's something new, it's something fresh, and it takes something that we've all come to cherish during the pandemic, like our daily walks, um, makes them the center point, and then disrupts and challenges and plays with um, these ways of navigating and thinking of public space. Um, and yeah, I hope that after this event, if you haven't already, you'll find the time to go on a journey with us, with a win. Thank you, Ines. So um, we'll now pass over to Brendan, who is one half of Ray Interactive, to tell us a bit about the role he and Ray Interactive played in developing the technology and in the design of a win. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Um, I'd just like to say a shout out to uh, Phil and Billy before I get started. And um, um, thanks for everyone on the team. Um, I went for, for having us involved in it. It was a, a whirlwind of an experience and I um, was glad to be on it. Um, I'm going to give a little presentation um, with visuals. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and let's get started. And yeah, like Amanda said, I'll just talk about our role um, in the project and in, in a kind of broader context of in, in our work in general. So I'm Brendan. And Sam Healy and myself are the core duo uh, behind Ray Interactive. And we partner with creative companies, uh, cultural organizations, and artists to help bring ideas to life. Sam's the technical director and lead programmer. And my core strengths are in visual communication and interaction design. Um, so for my five minutes, I would like to share an overview of the type of projects we've been working on lately in this kind of COVID period, uh, which will reveal a, a strand that runs through our work on AWEN and beyond. So that the string of projects kind of share a question, which is how can we leverage the power of mobile and remote technologies that help deliver meaningful experiences in relation to nature? So before we started at WEN, we were working on another mobile location-based interactive experience. And this is a collaboration with, uh, with artist Victoria Evans, which uses data sonification to turn three months of tidal data, along with the relationship between the earth, moon, and sun into an ever-evolving piece of generative audio. And the work aids a deeper understanding of how the land, moon, and sun influence tidal patterns, uh, giving us a, an enlightening condensed snippet of the relationship uh, uh, um, of these interrelationships uh, through, through the power of uh, one of these devices. I'm holding up a mobile phone, anyone can't see me. Um, so as part of our next collaboration, The Rooted Sea by Sonia Metreshala, along with Miriam Walsh of Ascus Art and Science, um, which is about endangered coastal ecosystems and wetland habitats, we have been asked a similar question. What role can technology, or rather what role should or shouldn't technology play in experiences or artistic interventions that connect us to nature? So there's a, there's a tension between nature and technology. There's a sense that they're pulling in, in, in opposite directions. So how can we create a, an experience focused on nature, but relies on this technology, which in a sense takes us away from nature? 
this is something we struggled with um, on Make the Tide song, and again during the development of a when. So we, we appear to have this dichotomy. Uh, but in our opinion, it's a bit of a misconception. With Owen, we have an attempt to co-opt the power of mobile technology to create something um, more like this, more of a feedback loop or a virtual circle, if you like, where the technology plays a vital role in our understanding of nature. You know, the technology shouldn't be ignored, but should be embraced. So in a similar way, our understanding of some of the science embedded in Owen has a similar feedback loop. So if you just replace the phone here with a satellite, you know, satellite observations are, are also vital in our, in our understanding of the globe and climate science. And AI and machine learning plays an increasingly important role in analyzing this huge amount of data in order to help us make more informed decisions. So uh, um, we have these kind of two feedback loops. And as Matt said earlier, with AWEN, one of our goals was to drive a, a local experience, but based on our understandings from this kind of global overview. This, was, uh, this is a photo called Earthrise by Bill Anders, and it was taken from the Apollo 8 on its moon orbit mission. Um, and it's, it, it created what's called the overview effect. And it's a, it's a deeper shared appreciation um, that this pale blue dot, our life raft in almost infinite nothingness, uh, contains everything that we know and love. Uh, but by today's standards, a very simple piece of technology was used to create this image. Um, but the photo's profound effect uh, on shifting our attitude uh, towards our planet is well documented. Um, and now there's, there's more computing power in our pocket computers than was on Apollo 8 and the ground control combined. So like the camera on the Apollo mission pointing back at Earth, uh, we aim to use technology, the technology of today um, for experiences like Tide Sound and Owen for a similar purpose, and that's to strengthen our, our connection to nature. So that brings me back to you know, my question, how can, you know, we, we've, we've learned loads of things from our work on, on Tide Sound and Owen, which uh, we hope to bring forward as Owen develops, uh, but also onto future projects like the Rooted Sea but uh, we have no definitive answers. So technologies like you know, mobile satellites and artificial intelligence are here to stay. Uh, and at Ray Interactive, we, we see projects like AWEN being extremely important in helping reframe our relationship to technology uh, as well as our relationship to nature. Um, and uh, that's me. Let's talk to you. Great. Thank you, Brendan. You managed to get two of my favorite things in there, that uh, Earthrise image and a reference to Pale Blue Dot. Uh, Carl Sagan's a bit of a hero of mine, so um, well done on that. Um, okay, so um, we're going to hear now from our, from our final panelist. So this one is over to you, Daisy. Um, so yeah, tell us a bit about your role in placemaking for Edinburgh and why creating places for people that reflect and complement the communities that live in them is so important. Thank you, Amanda. Let me just start my video. Hopefully you can see me now. Um, thank you. What a joy to be here. And even the past 15 minutes, um, you know, it's so inspiring already, uh, the confluence of art and science. And I love that image, Brendan, of, of the earth rise and the fact that one photograph could change the narrative of of how, um, you know, how things were done. Uh, it is absolutely inspiring. So thank you again for having me here. I have a disclaimer, I'm not, um, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a technical wizard like, like the others on the panel. I'm not an artist. Um, I am an architect, an urban designer. And very recently, as of six weeks ago now, I've joined the City of Edinburgh Council um, to lead the city's work in place making and mobility. Um, over the last decade, my work has um, focused a lot on sustainable transport and on climate action. So I was a member of Edinburgh's Climate Commission and on the evidence group for Scotland's Climate Assembly. So I've been very lucky to, to have been um, almost on the front line of discussing climate action with communities across Scotland, um, trying to understand the barriers, trying to understand how we can unlock 
you know, what is needed to be done with the urgency that is required to move forward. And, and as Amanda, you said, you know, the defining um, challenge of our times is climate crisis and how we collaboratively come together to face that challenge. So I am delighted, as I said, to be here. Um, I want to talk about our city streets and our spaces, how we connect our place and people, but doing so through the, through the lens of, as I said, collaboration, through the lens of art and science, as the others on the panel have been talking about. Um, my role in the council is a new one. For years now, we've been talking about silo busting, planning and transport need to work closer together. And this role, which, which is placemaking and mobility, starts to, to bridge that gap. Um, it's about creating good places, creating places that, that meet the requirements and challenges of the 21st century, environmental, economic, social. We know that we will need that effective integration across all sectors to come together to face these challenges. Themes of equity and social justice are so deeply embedded in what we experience on our streets and the same themes of, of uh, equity and social ju justice are embedded within the climate crisis conversation. Um, how we travel, how we experience our streets, our public spaces, how safe and welcome we feel out there in, in our public spaces and squares and streets. You know, it's being discussed far more widely now I grew up in India and Indonesia, and I've had the good fortune to have lived and worked in, in Singapore, US, in London, and since 2004, I've made Edinburgh my home. But over the past few years, since I've been working in, in sustainability, I've reflected how much the quality of my life in all these places were influenced by how easily, how conveniently, how affordably I could get around. In Bombay and Singapore, I used public transport to get everywhere. I felt safe traveling late at night. In America, I lived in a small town where you know, walking was, was not the easiest option. You'd hop in a car to get your pint of milk because um, there were no footways. Um, I wasn't in a good place then physically or mentally. And I think my dependency on the car played a big part in that. In Edinburgh and London, I discovered the joy of cycling, um, you know, getting to places quicker, feeling healthier. But in Edinburgh, especially in the city that, you know, that is so glorious, so magnificent that, you know, we're lucky to live in. I genuinely, genuinely have discovered the magic of walking, you, you know, the experiences that you, that, that you have, whether it's the meandering streets of Old Town, I live in the city center, or the big capital streets of, you know, of Newtown. Um, it's just, it's just a wonderful city to, to, to walk and to explore and enjoy. Um, especially during lockdown i think you know so many of us have explored and as as Ines was saying um, you know seen a different side to our city through the experience of walking um, so many people have asked me in the past you know there's a whole discussion around walkable cities walkable city centers i lead, led a program called the city center transformation which is looking to make our city center a walkable city center and you know what does that mean to me, it's about cities or streets that are designed with that human perspective, what, you know, what the panel have been discussing so far, the walking and cycling, or, you know, more broadly wheeling, if you're wheeling a buggy or on a scooter, it becomes a first mode of connecting people to each other, to play, you know, to productivity, how we experience the street, a place for chance interactions, an extension of the playground for kids, um, a gallery for installations. <laughs> not just transport, it's about art and science and technology and human connections. I'm so excited to be here, as I said, to, to learn from, from this group and hopefully take back with me into my work um, some of the learning from how that collaborative, really proactive collaborative um, work, working with communities can, can be taken forward in a way that we, are, you know, we, we face this challenge together. I'll stop here, very happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much, Daisy. And, and thank you all, that's such fascinating perspectives, um, such a multidisciplinary team, all bringing something new and important to this kind of crucial conversation about how we can bring these disciplines and areas together and use them to really engage the public with some of the, the issues that are so central to their lives, in, in this instance, climate. Um, so we're now going to have a little bit of a chair discussion. We've got 15 minutes or so um, to hear a bit more from the panel and have a little bit of a conversation uh, about some of the things they've touched on. Um, we've already mentioned when's overall objective is to bridge 
the gap between global data sets and models about the environment and climate and the local everyday perspective. Um, the bottom line of the scientific evidence about climate change is, is pretty well known. We know, we know what it is, we know we're causing it, and we know what we should do to stop it. But it's sometimes really hard to act when the problem's so much bigger than, than the human scale. Uh, and this map was obviously talking about in, in his introduction. Um, so I'm gonna throw the question to, to you first, Ines. What role do you think that the arts can, can play in helping to tackle fundamental challenges for science and society like climate change? Yeah, um, thank you, Amanda. I guess um, there's a book by Mike Hume, which is called Weather um, Cultures of Climate. And it, it speaks and touches on this, as do a lot of um, contemporary thinkers like Donna Haraway or Margaret Atwood speaking of everything change. Um, fun fundamentally, I think um, all knowledge of climate is cultural. Um, it, it, you, you can't separate um, cultures from where um, these ideas of climate were made or through which they were expressed. Um, so whilst scientific knowledge is held um, very highly in Western societies, um, in other societies, religious and indigenous knowledge is valued equally or more. So this idea that we can separate um, climate change from culture is, um, I think, a myth that's, um, yeah, and, and the idea that it's not culturally led or culturally influenced or something that um, is driven by culture is, some, is, is a myth that's sort of starting to break down. Um, as you say, we have known the impacts and the future that awaits us with the data we have, and we have known for a while. Um, so I think what's really exciting now is that through these initiatives and through the multidisciplinary collaborations, um, cultural led initiatives um, where art is also involved, we can open up spaces of inquiry um, to experiment, to intervene, but also to think critically about where we're coming from and where we want to go and think of potential futures. Yeah, that's some of that's music to my ears, Ines. Um, I once had a badge that said science is culture, um, which I created on the back of being told by a, by a, by a funder that we were not a cultural organization. Um, so I, I feel very strongly that uh, obviously science is, is, a, is a part of that sort of rich cultural mix. Um, and it, actually coming, Brendan, the point you made about this potential tension between nature and technology, but then gave that lovely example of the, of the Earthrise image. And that's a, an example of the power that one piece of visual that a material can have in terms of changing global mindsets. It's, it's credited with being the Kickstarter of the, the modern environment movement. Um, so maybe this question is to, to Matt and to Brendan. Um, how much more power can these interactions have if you add data, data large data sets and an AI into the mix? Anyone want to answer that? I thought Brendan I think I'll leave. to go first, but anyway. No, I was, I was going to leave it to you. <laughs> um, yes, so I mean, so this is a it's a it's a it's a two-edged sword, I think. So the one thing that we need to be aware of, right, is that you know a lot of the use of artificial intelligence right now, particularly kind of big commercial players, use it in a way to kind of tailor experiences, tailor these sort of interactions in a way to be more likable, to not to really challenge, but to just kind of conform to what you really like. I mean, we're all aware of online streaming services using artificial intelligence algorithm to serve us more of similar content that we supposedly have already enjoyed. So I think what we're trying to do here is, is, to, is to go far beyond that, is to actually try and use these new technologies as a way to not only um, work with the, with the existing you know, preferences and kind of existing mindsets that people have when they approach them in the first case, but actually to also challenge and evolve and more of that and, and actually be in a dialogue, not only amongst ourselves and amongst you know, the, the, you know, the various contributors to this project, but actually with the audience as well. 
Um, and there, I think, you know, this is kind of, this is really where we're getting to the realm of sort of AI art, where, you know, effectively we use, the artists use AI as both the medium as well as the subject matter. So it's not just to say, we, you know, AI is used in some way to just extend the, 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 the old fashioned paintbrush into some kind of new digital environment, but it's also there to peel back what is behind that digital environment and pose some questions. Um, you know, a lot of these debates are kind of very well rehearsed, but what we are hoping to do, particularly with respect to the environment, is look at how technology is actually shaping perspectives on the environment and how we can use the uh, experiences such as a when to basically not challenge that, but to, you know, understand that, lay that somewhat bare so that we can all engage with it. Which is kind of, you know, doing that, however, is what Brendan was sort of helping, helping develop, which is that kind of idea that through various kinds of interactions within, within the experience, you get to see that there's some kind of, a, you know, what's happening behind there. And, and some of them are hints and some of them are more explicit. Thanks, Matt. So, um, Brendan, I know you talked about some of the other projects you've been working on. Um, were any of the others ambulatory experiences in the, in the way that AWEN is? Um, Tai Song was location based, but not ambulatory. It, you can you can have the experience from wherever you are, but it promotes you to go to the beach because it have an experience because it's based on you know um, the tides. It just gives you a, a stronger connection. Um, so yeah, GPS tracking in a sense, but only based on you know kind of a point location rather than a, a trajectory. Because that's something that I found um, really really valuable about the AWEN experience was that it was very much connecting people with, with physical locations as well as with the concepts and some information about the science. And I guess this relates, Daisy, to what you were saying about rediscovering this, this joy of, of walking and this the, the potential that, I guess, projects of this sort can have for connection with place. 100%, um, you know, since since I've been involved in, you know, just, just hearing about what's going on with the REN and, and, and the project itself, my head's been buzzing with how we can start to use some of this technology in the work that that is done, you know, through, through councils or through our partner organizations. And one of the things that, one of the, you know, we know that change is difficult and we know that difficult decisions are going to have to be made over the next few years, especially as we come to tackling the climate crisis, Edinburgh's got the low emission zone, for example, that's out for consultation, or, you know, there's, there's, there's such a real drive to, to tackling what we know needs to be done. But it, I think that change then sometimes results in, um, I don't want to say negativity, but there is, we need to be better at communicating the benefits of that change. And I think, you know, projects like these, you know, storytelling, art, um, starting to give people an immersive experience of what their street could be like and you know how they could shape their streets or how communities would come together and say actually let's try this and if we take away a lane of parking for example you know taking bringing it from art to to, to the more mundane what what the, what does that do to our street and I think there's so much potential in in how we can you know, genuinely collaborate to tell stories, to tell new stories, and to really create uh, places that, you know, as, as you were saying, reflect the communities that live, live alongside. So it brings to mind, one of the things I know that as a, as a group, we really wanted to, this experience to do, was to be, to be playful. Um, so maybe, Inez, I know that this was important to you, that this experience was was playful for the user. Can you maybe just talk a little bit about that? Because then I'm keen to kind of relate that back to some of the conversation we're having about placemaking and the value of playable cities, the, the potential to, to really embed that thinking in what we do about our design of cities. But yeah, talk to us about play. <laughs> sure. Um, I think so much of climate change narratives are so heavy um, and they're so paralyzing and fear inducing um, and I like I was saying earlier like we've we've had that form of communication for quite a while and we're meeting with resistance um, 
the resistance that Daisy was um, speaking of just now. So something needs to shift in the way we communicate, something needs to shift in the way we make these things tangible for people. And play is something that we've all experienced at one point or another, and something that maybe as we get older, we forget to do. Um, but and, and these moments of play have been really treasured personally for me and missed during lockdown. Um, so it felt like something fresh that we could provide the public with as well, and that we'd potentially open up the scope of um, engaging like with different age groups, even though young people today are a lot more aware of climate change than, for example, my generation when I was their age or my parents' generation. Um, so I think play is almost like the, the unifying thread that allows anyone at any point of their lifespan to sort of nip in and maybe do a small gesture that might, you know, make them feel uncomfortable, but that might make them experience a global narrative through a bodily experience. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly something that from a science festival perspective and from a science engagement perspective, um, we're all about play. And I think that was, it's been really beautiful to see that embodied in this experience. Um, Daisy, talking, taking that to a city level, um, in terms of what Edinburgh might do, where can we go with this making our cities more accessible and more playful? And what role do collaborations of particularly around the ambulatory experiences potentially play in that? I mean, I think that, you know, what Ines was saying just now about the, the narrative shift and the need to, to be positive you know, in the narrative around climate change is, is happening. It's starting to happen now, which is brilliant. And I think work like this can, can, really, can really accelerate that. Uh, two years ago, we worked with, uh, with the Science Festival, actually, when I led the City Centre Transformation to do, we had this, we had Lego, Lego bricks and lots of, you know, play equipment, like little bricks and um, bikes and things like that, buses. And, you know, people could come in and then create their, their streets. So it was very tactile and, you know, you could create creative and tactile. And it wasn't just children doing that, even though it was, you know, supposedly aimed for, for the younger, younger folk. And it was amazing. It was amazing to see how suddenly people just view their, their streets in a completely different way. And I think, um, yeah, so I think that there's so much opportunity to, to take some of that play and, and um, you know, the ideas around play and you know, directly translate into the work that we're doing in the council and, and beyond with our partners. Um, for the Venice Biennale this year, I was lucky enough to be one of the designers uh, working with a young person, a 16-year-old in Wester Hills. And um, we used Wester Hills as an example of, you know, she was very clear that she, want, she wanted to in incorporate play within what she saw the place could be. So we, we treated it like a jigsaw. So, you know, you can take kids, you know, people are not afraid to take a jigsaw apart and then put it back together. So, you know, we should be we should feel the same about, about a place, you know, you know, it's okay to disrupt and change things. And then bring it back the way you want to. So sorry, I'm going on a bit, but this is really exciting to see how we can really shift narratives in a positive, optimistic manner um, to, to really make change happen. Thanks, Daisy. Um, I'm just gonna kind of throw things open to the, to the panel a little bit. Obviously I, I've talked a fair bit and I've, I've been guiding this conversation. Is there anything that you haven't had a chance to get in yet that you would really, really like to share with with your fellow panelists or or with the or with the audience before we start taking some questions in a few minutes. I think one one thing that I'd like to just stress, and I think this is kind of really important. I think we've hinted at it in places, but maybe we haven't made it entirely explicit, is that this is a very much a prototyping process. Um, and and we really, really invite all our audience members tonight. Uh, to visit the website uh, www.awen.earth um, where you can access the experience, take the experience, but also leave feedback. That's super important for us. Um, we already mentioned that there's, you know, there's plans, you know, Brendan's mentioned some of the future developments uh, we might be looking at uh, to, devolve, to, to evolve the, um, the application, the, the work itself further. Uh, but critically, we, we want to do that in a way that is you know, highlighting and, and building on the strengths 
and perhaps addressing some of the things that people that have taken the experience have found frustrating. Uh, so we were really, really looking forward uh, to, to receive your feedback um, and to engage to engage you in the co-creation journey as much as as much as the, the as I say the interdisciplinary team and here of course we also want to thank uh, particularly our our science team um, Ines has already mentioned some of the names um, Sophie and, and William McCannis um, um, Aditya uh, whose surname unfortunately I can't really pronounce properly but he's our amazing um, AI expert who's been working very very hard with our technical manager uh, Evan Morgan on on developing some of the analytic tools behind uh, behind some of these prompts that Ines has so beautifully described earlier. That as you go along the walk, they kind of suggest you do certain things, and 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 that is you know some of them are are very data driven, and this is kind of uh, uh, developed um, um, quite 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 carefully. Um, and and um, as well as our uh, amazing games and sound advisor um, and creator of the sound actually. Uh, Tom DiMaggio. So, you know, the, the, it's an amazing team, lots of really, really interesting, sometimes diverging perspectives, sometimes, um, you know, the role of, of, of an uh, experiential AI person like me is to try and sort of find a common ground amongst our different uh, varying perspectives. But I think the, the critical point right now is that we've, we've, we've done our, our, our best, our prototype is now out, um, and we'd like to evolve this and, and, the, and, and have the next phase of the co-creation journey with our audience. So we really, really strongly welcome um, all your feedback and, and we obviously encourage you to take the experience, but also to leave feedback at the end. There's only three very short questions. Um, so please, please make sure that you, you tell us what you feel um, and think and, 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 and what you've experienced. Thanks, Matt. Um, that's actually a very neat segue actually into um, the questions. So I'm just having a look at the questions that thank you um, to our audience members for starting to put some questions our way. Um, so one of the questions from Dennis O'Keefe was on what basis is it proposed to evaluate the quality of the immersive experience? So Matt, obviously you've talked about this being a pilot um, and that we are seeking feedback from anybody that um, takes part in it. So uh, if you haven't done a WEN yet, uh, I would encourage you to, to do it. Uh, if you have done it, do it again. And, and yeah, we're, we're, we're here to listen to how the experience was. Um, Matt, from a Futures Institute perspective, um, do you maybe want to say a little bit more about the how you'll evaluate that and take that into any Kind of future learnings or iterations? Yeah, so well, so um, one person that I should also mention was a very core member of the team uh, is, is Julianne Fushi, who is an amazing um, um, researcher, social scientist, uh, who's working really hard to actually capture not only, uh, you know, and, and structure not only the feedback that we might be getting from, from our audiences, but also feedback from across the team. Um, so our main focus right now is to try to understand not only um, you know, how does the experience look like from the audience side, but also is the process of creating something this collaborative uh, right? Uh, what are the challenges? How can we improve it? How can we make it better, both for the phase two, the future of ON, um, as well as um, other uh, similar projects I've mentioned. I mean, the new real program um, is, is, is looking forward to actually working with um, our festival partners um, and other stakeholders in and around the city to build more uh, projects um, like this and, and, and different um, as well. But um, we are, we're kind of honing in that methodology, working with, with Edinburgh's amazing creative sector. Um, and in terms, of the, in terms of the experiential AI, I think one of the critical things that we are particularly interested to highlight moving forward is the idea of literacy. So how transparent is actually um, data within these digital creative experiences, how, um, how transparent is the processing, the algorithms, the sort of the magic behind the scenes, um, if you like, um, as well as, um, you know, what, what are users sort of choices 
in, in designing particular sort of futures um, using um, AI technologies. So these will be definitely things that we'll be looking for in particular when we, when we analyze the data. Uh, on the flip side of that, there's also just a lot of troubleshooting and, and, and little tweaks that we can do um, to, make, to make the walk. Um, and again, this is again, we're not, we are definitely not turning into an online streaming service where we're just trying to conform to whatever the users are, are most interested in getting. But it's more to say that we would like to ensure that it is as accessible um, as well as as, as as transparent, as legible. Uh, in all its multiple layers as we possibly can. And if anybody's interested in a little bit of the, the science and the thought that's went behind the, 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 um, um, the individual parts of the experience, you can actually go to the website and, and there's, a, there's a bit which is a sort of layers of awareness where you can actually explore all the scientific data and, and, and models and the concerns uh, that, were, um, that, were, that were sort of incorporated into the experience. Um, effectively, every single action you do in the app has a relevance in these global data sets, in these global uh, models. Thanks, Matt. And then just, um, just quickly before we move on to, to talk to some of the others, we've got a question from Karen Forbes, which seems to follow on um, sort of neatly from what you've been saying about the duration of time that you would like to develop the next phase of the project beyond the initial prototyping. I think it's fair to say that uh, we would have loved more time um, in the in the run up to this. Um, how much do you want for the next phase? I mean, in a sense, you know, how long is the piece of string, right? So um, we we have a particular deadline. Um, in a sense, we would like to um, showcase a, a new version of a win or, a, or, a, or an evolution of a win, a small evolution perhaps, but evolution nonetheless, um, in around the time of the uh, COP26 uh, climate conference in, in Glasgow, uh, which is this autumn. Uh, but there's also, um, you know, an opportunity to build this something, you know, to scale up much further. Um, so in a sense, we, we are kind of hoping um, that this is an ongoing journey uh, the first bit was really, you know, hopefully the most stressful one. And, and from now on, we, we do things in a more calm way um, as it happened. And, and here we would very much like to acknowledge and thank our funders, um, the Scottish Funding Council through the Data, Dri Data Driven Innovation Initiative at the university, who's very kindly supported this, uh, this project. And the thing was, it was a short term response to the crisis of the cultural sector that of course occurred last year with the COVID effectively canceling Edinburgh festivals in, 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 in by and large. Um, and, and that really spurred on, um, on a lot of this development and we wanted to deliver something on relatively short time scales. But we are, we're, we're trying to now build slightly more, they're never quite relaxed, they're quite intensive. This is quite, you know, quite a lot of work needs to go into any individual bit of this project, but uh, slightly more, um, longer term and, and more, more sort of paced uh, development. But hopefully you'll hear a lot more about when um, in sort of October, November time um, for COP26. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm going to move on quite rapidly because we're getting quite a few questions racking up. Um, so we've got a question from Robin Hill. Despite images of the earth as shown by Brendan, there are still flat earthers, similarly climate change deniers and other irrational beliefs. Do you think the art approach can convince or influence this section of society? Most interactive exhibitions require a receptive audience. How do you access the critically illiterate? So maybe to Inez first and then Brendan for your thoughts. Sure. I, I don't know if what I'm going to say is going to be like politically correct, but um, yeah, I guess that's part of a debate that happens. Um, I think personally, um, we've seen climate change deniers, we've seen flat earthers, um, COVID-19 deniers. Um, when it snowed greatly in Madrid, uh, there were people who were snow deniers, like there's, there's deniers for a lot of things. Um, and I think particularly, it's a lack of a narrative that people can hold on to and where they feel like they are reflected in. Um, and this is part of maybe the, um, the critical introspection that science needs to do with itself and with the way it communicates with the public. Um, so 
um, it's 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 become very alien to a lot of people, a lot of scientific research and a lot of work that's involved um, to come across these great advances and great discoveries um, that science shares with us. And sometimes the language is cryptic. Um, it, it, it does create that illiteracy um, if you're not, you know, really learned on certain terms or you don't really understand the way things sort of interconnect and mesh. So I think that's one of the things that culture and art provide. They take people's experience at the forefront and they situate that as a condition for something to take place. Um, and that sort of intermeshing with art and science, which I can see is also part of one of the further on um, questions, Amanda. Um, I think that's where value is created and that's where meaning is created, but it's also where you bring people along and be part of the conversation. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely a crisis of narrative um, and it's one that has been created over a long time and one that will take time to you know, deconstruct and find really ways in which these people can be brought along rather than separated into, um, yeah, shifted to a corner and ignored because that won't work as we've seen with politics. Thank you, Ines. Yeah, you're right. I think we've got another question here from Xiaofeng Dai. It says, a great pleasure to follow EFI's activities. Curious to hear a bit more of an explicit response to the moderator's initial question about the role of art in collaborations as such. Um, and I think as uh, from my perspective as, a, as the organizer of the Science Festival, my interest in art science comes from the ability that powerful collaborations, when these work well, they can open new windows and provide new perspectives onto some really complex issues. Um, but I'm no artist. Uh... No, I think, I think that's totally right. Um, I think what's really exciting about this project is that it's a co-creation. So art doesn't sit within a sort of role of visualizing scientific information and um, science isn't used, you know, it, it's, it's a lot more entangled and it shows the complexity of living with climate change. Um, I don't know if Matt, you might be able to speak more about this co-creative process um, because it, it's true, art doesn't, in this case, the artistic process isn't only about that sort of end product. It's also having these conversations and finding where value is and what we want to communicate to people. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, art in a sense is a method and a, there's, a, there's a symbolic language, I think, behind it. There's a, there's a way to basically, um, you know, so a lot of the traditional public engagement, I've done a lot of traditional public engagements as, you know, Amanda and I very well know each other from, from years of various kinds of projects. But um, there's, there's you, know, you know, often we try to, what we try to do is effectively turn, you know, kind of complex ideas through metaphors and, 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 um, and parallels and, you know, you know, and also sometimes just simplifying, translating the language from some, something that's more jargony, more kind of, um, you know, specific uh, to something that's a bit more accessible. Um, I think art goes one step further. I think art allows for interpretation that is a is a bit more you know there's a bit more visceral there's a bit more kind of you know it, it comes not from a place of just restructuring the thoughts or or re reconfiguring the way something is explained but it it, it tries to strike a chord that it, that is kind of more about a a a a a was the was the real matter at stake what's really at stake and it does that in in fact in a similar way with with trying to affect to take different perspectives perspectives but by pushing the envelope much further than you do by just you know simplifying the language removing jargon and um and 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 trying to kind of um you know metaphor metaphor size if that's a word i don't know if it is but um, um what's at stake it can go it can go one step further where a lay participant right somebody who doesn't necessarily you know have, doesn't have all the access all the knowledge that is a you know that, that's being that's being um, um used can can nonetheless identify themselves with what's going on because i think that's one of the critical thing and I, and I think that question from from robin was very poignant um you know one of the reasons and and i know I've, I've actually hosted an event for an edinburgh science festival a few years back uh, about 
um, you know, things like, you know, um, you know, we've never landed on the moon theater thing was that year uh, with some really esteemed colleagues from, from Cambridge who are, you know, the vast, one of the vast, um, um, one of the most significant reasons why uh, people start to doubt these official scientific narratives is lack of the ability to identify with the, with the science, with the scientific elite, with the language, with the culture of science. Um, and it's often the case that that's based on actually lots of sort of socioeconomical factors. You know, people feel excluded from, from, from what they see as the, as the forefront of society. And, and henceforth, they are, they're much more likely to doubt that what is being done at the forefront of science or any other field is to their benefit because they don't, they're not able to identify. And I think art is one of the ways in which you can identify because you can feel about something. It, it can inspire ways to, to feel about something even if you don't understand all the words or all the mechanics, which I find super fascinating and, and impressive. And I, I, I loved working with Ines in particular, sort of trying to craft some of those kind of ways in which we stay absolutely true to what the meaning of scientific theory is, but make it as accessible and as, as experiential. This is where experiential eye comes in, as, as, as part of an experience as possible. Thanks, Matt. I think we've got time probably for one more question. And Brendan, this is coming to you, and I don't know whether this is something you can answer in two minutes. Um, but we've got a question from Abs about, um, could you elaborate a bit more on the elements of game design, et cetera, embedded in the experience and how the development of that evolved and how it links to play and playable cities? So um, I guess the first bit, the game design, um, do you want to talk a bit tech, quick tech? Um, so yeah, the, the, the game design element was not really in, the technology side of things, but more written into the abstract interpretations of the of the scientific content. So it was uh, more in Ness's realm about um, turning the more physical aspects uh, that we we're asking people to do with the experience into the playful elements. So the the actual design of the app was was refined over time to make it uh, as less invasive as possible, so people could spend a bit more time focusing on on playing with physical environment and, and the nature around them so yeah so you're looking for that yeah so that the technology was was supporting the playfulness of the experience which in turn was delivering that playful city ambulatory experience um so exactly. all throwing the sort of something into the hat what you throw into hats um so great and i think um I mean, obviously that for me is what gave this experience so much power, picking up on what Inez and Matt, you were saying there, um, as a science communicator of, of 20 years, we know that facts alone do not move hearts and minds. We need emote, powerful, emotive experiences to connect people to, to these issues. Um, and I think this is what this collaboration has done so beautifully, and I'm honored to have been a part of it and we are out of time. Um, so unless anybody's got anything that they cannot leave this conversation without saying, if, that, if you have, say it now. All go and walk with the when. That's the only thing we need to, we definitely need to mention at the end, right? Please Absolutely. download, well, go to the <laughs> yeah. website, get on and, and, you know, see you outside effectively. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as Matt said, it's a pilot experience. If you have done it, do it again. If you haven't done it, do it. And happy walking. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and good night. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.